this is, don't worry, don't worry. Um, actually, I've seen that a number of times that, you know, you write CISO in Google and you get back Cisco survey. So, um, yeah, I'm definitely not working for that company. Um, and by the way, for the guys who were this morning and saw me take off the shirt, I'm not going to do this again, okay, because I have only this one. So I'm, I have to disappoint you. This is not going to happen. Uh, no other exciting stuff. But maybe some exciting results from the survey that we did with security managers and the things we might have learned or we, we thought we, we think we have learned from them about how you can manage uh, your information security and also learn a little bit about what others do and see in the field currently happening. Um, maybe a quick question. Who of you is a security manager here in the room? One, two, three. A little bit? Okay, half, kind of. Um, so this is, this is for, for the people who raised their hands and for these who didn't raise their hands but who have a manager and you want to maybe explain why application security is important to your manager. Um, this slide is just a quick one why I'm in the room. Um, so I've done for OWASP, uh, we have launched this uh, CISO survey project about a year ago. I also work a lot uh, with CISOs and advise them in my day job. I mean, I have to earn a living. Um, good. So for, uh, before I go into the survey, we have two projects that are interesting uh, for chief information security officers. One is the CISO guide that has been, uh, the key author for that was um, Marco Morana. Um, these two projects are like sister projects. So. Uh, the team is quite overlapping and what we learn in the one we put in the next and vice versa. And the, the other one is the CISO survey report which we see on the top. Um, I would say if you, think, if you look at it, uh, the guide is like a strategic part where you, where you know how to do things and the, uh, the CISO survey report is the tactical intelligence about what kind of things you might want to do or what's currently hot among other security managers. Um, the methodology we had was uh, basically we, we developed a survey, we sent it out to a larger community. Uh, there's always a question about bias, about selection bias when you send this to, uh, to managers and uh, we received over a hundred replies. Um, we sent it not only within the OWASP community, in fact most of the people we addressed were outside of the OWASP community. So, although still there is a certain bias because it's biased by the people we can reach, um, it is not kind of uh, an inward looking survey that, that was only about OWASP people. The opposite would be true. Um, so we sent that out and we followed by some selective personal interviews and then uh, we collected, compiled all of this and this is the result that you're going to see now. We are currently in phase three which is basically we, re we are revising the questions we did a year ago and then we're going to send it out again. Uh, go to, go back, go to phase one again. Good. So, cyber attacks, cyber attacks ahead. That's, but the question is from where are they coming from? And uh, one of the things we ask people is, do you see rather uh, more external threats or internal ones? You might remember that actually a couple of years ago, most security managers were quite concerned about the insider threat. So we found that an interesting question. And Quite interesting for me, like 85% saw the, the main threat, uh, no, so external threats on the rise, increasing quite dramatically. While for internal threats, this is pretty stable. So there's a certain shift in the perception where your threats are coming from. A second thing we looked at is also what's the main area of risk? I mean, if you, if you look at organizations today, what do they have? I mean, you have firewalls, antivirus, anti-malware, and then you have some application security investments. Um, personally, I'm sometimes stunned by the fact that actually uh, 
I, I sometimes have the feeling there is more money spent here than in application security. I'm not sure whether that kind of resonates with what you experience. But it seems like that the main areas of risk managers recognize that actually this is now in moving towards application security. So if you are kind of thinking about what you should do, um, you should probably take a look at your balance between these two areas because uh, at least, oops, why is this? Oh, sorry. I'm, I should be more gentle with my mouse. Because this is, why is this? This shouldn't move automatically. Okay. Because this, this is definitely uh, more important currently as a, as a risk source than infrastructure. And we not only asked them what's the situation right now, but we were also wondering, um, okay, how is this evolving over time? So do we, do we see like, oh, this is kind of stable or is, is something increasing? And again here we asked, um, blue is increase, uh, red is same and yellow is decrease. So for application security, they see quite a change in threats increasing. So two thirds of the managers saw that actually application security threats are increasing. While for infrastructure related uh, threats, this is more, the, the majority was more like, okay, this is fairly stable. By the way, if you have questions, uh, you can also ask them during the presentation. So we don't have to wait. Or if you disagree, I'm fine with that too. Yes, Good. Um, you disagree. Uh, we sent out, well, hundreds, and we re the question is more what we received back, and, uh, or? I'm trying to work out whether the hundred is. Yes. No, uh, we sent out about maybe a thousand, and we got back about a hundred. Okay. So. What's the survey type? Uh, the question was whether we targeted specific uh, companies or whether we just sent something out into the internet ether. Is that the question? Yes. Um, we did not target specific companies, but we targeted specifically chief information security officers. So there is a number of um, conferences that specifically target this group. And we basically, we had presentations there. Uh, we had personal networks in these areas, so we leveraged that. Not, not only me, but there's a, a group of people. We also sent this out through OWASP. Uh, we also sent this out to large industry organizations and asked, okay, uh, could you send this to your CISO and ask him whether he could reply? Okay, brilliant. Thanks a lot for the questions. Uh, that makes it much more interesting. Um, so, I would say for statistical significance, actually I feel quite confident with that one because the, the, the standard deviation is, well, I think this is still quite okay. Maybe standard deviation 5%. Um, yeah, well, beyond that, of course, we also asked them what do you see as the five sources of risk? So kind of first we looked at external, internal, application versus infrastructure, and then we thought, okay, okay, what's, what's actually your problem? Yeah? And um, interestingly, when I talk in my business with, uh, with managers, often you hear, oh, oh, I don't have money, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, so I was very curious whether that would be number one. Uh, as you can see, it was not number one. Lack of budget is only number four. So they, their number one with quite significant uh, distance was lack of awareness of security issues and then some source code, uh, inadequate testing, and then of course budget and staffing. So these are the things they see as their top five sources of um, risk. Yes, please. Would you say uh, we did not have a second slot where you could say lack of understanding. So I could imagine that many people might have seen them as the same. So, so the question was, did we distinguish between lack of understanding and lack of awareness? Yeah, and no, we did not distinguish. So in, 
actually, you pr these are actually the answers people could choose. And there was, uh, there, of course, it was not only five. There was a list of about 15 possible choices. Lack of understanding. Yeah. I'm sorry? Lack of understanding was one of them. No, lack of understanding was not one of them. Though from a manager perspective, I mean, I work with these guys also in daily life. I think they probably see this as the same. Yeah, I, I know there's, I know it's not the same, obviously, yeah? But yeah, yeah. Um, okay. people guess, may perceive I it. Guess Yes, yes. So this lack of awareness yeah, would imply it's more, do people understand there's a problem? That's awareness. Yeah, but we did not ask for, after they are aware of it, do they understand what they are doing? Yeah, um, after we, so we first asked them, okay, what's kind of the, the sources of your risk? What's your problem? And now we are thinking about, okay, what are you doing about it? So what is your... Uh, what, what, what do you invest? Where do you invest? Where do you put your money? And we looked, we asked them first, okay, where, where, what, what aspects of your annual investment are um, going in infrastructure and in application security? And we did not necessarily, we didn't put them in, in financial direct relationship, but we first wondered, okay, which one is actually increasing? Because Organization may be very different. I mean, some have probably much more uh, need for infrastructure, but we were more interested in the trend. And that I found reasonably interesting that actually application security, they see there's more risks in ap from applications, and they also see they want to do more investment in application security. Compared to uh, infrastructure security is more stable, and equally is the investment more stable. So it's kind of reinforcing what we saw before. It's like the investment is the answer to the risk. The investment is the answer to the threats. Um, yeah. And of course then we ask, okay, so if, we, if you have your investment plans, what are your top priorities? So where do you would want to put your money? And maybe where do you want to talk with your manager whether you should put your money there? And there actually, again, uh, quite strong was security awareness and training. So this actually, in this case, includes understanding. And that was uh, quite significantly clear as position number one in the report. Uh, secure development lifecycle, testing, of course, um, application layer vulnerability management stuff, and code review. So relatively common, but I found it, for example, quite encouraging for my personal view that awareness was number one of their priorities where they were going to invest uh, going forward into the future. And um, we also asked them, okay, so probably you have something like a roadmap or a strategy. Actually, most people didn't. Or they had something and they didn't thought it's still adequate. So only about one in four believe their current application security strategy adequately addresses new risks like mobile, uh, bring your own device, web 2.0 and something like that. Um, which I found a little bit, whoo, yeah? I mean you could, yeah, people might want to modernize or kind of review uh, their strategy. Um, and another thing we looked at is how long is the time horizon for your strategy, for your roadmap. There were some, some uh, e quite exciting outliers, like three months. Or I mean, this is very short planning, if you imagine. Uh, you do a plan three months, and then you do a plan again. Uh, and another interesting outlier were like five years. I mean, in five years, I have no idea where the world's going to be in five years in terms of technology. Uh, but you saw quite a strong uh, point center of gravity in, in the range of one year or two years. So I would say the median, as you can see, is one year. And um, you have some, quite some people who do two years. We found this in, in so far interesting because we try to correlate this also with whether you have a better chance of getting investments. And I'm speaking about correlation, not causality. So we, we are not sure whether one thing uh, 
leads to the other, but we could see, we, we looked at what gave people a better chance for making investments, for increasing investment in application security. We looked at uh, do they have a CISO, what, what's kind of the level of the person, do they have may, maybe different um, uh, dependencies on uh, their strategy, whether it's higher or lower in application or infrastructure, and all these things did not show significant changes. Even when we looked for whether they had a security breach, we didn't find a significant indicator. I mean, there's often this um, anecdotal evidence that you encounter that people say, oh, we had a breach and now we have to invest more. Um, so we didn't see a significant statistical evidence for that. But that might be due to we don't have enough data yet. However, we saw a small benefit on, which was significant statistically, if you have a two-year strategy, that you have a better chance of getting uh, an increase in security investment. And we found that interesting, and we have a hypothesis why this is the case. The hypothesis is if you go into a normal budget cycle, you go in and your manager says, well, you know what, for this year the budget is X, Y, Z. And you can start to negotiate, but basically you can't really move a lot. So the counter move from the CISO perspective is then to say, well, you know what, okay, I can see that we can't put it in this year, but we can actually already put it in year two. And because we have the strategy of two years, so we already plan it for year two. So that means next year, when you go into the same negotiation, you can say, well, actually, we already budgeted this last year, that we're going to have that this year. So you're coming in with an advantageous uh, position in the budget negotiation. I, I had that conversation with a couple of CISOs and they said, well, yeah, that might be the case, but we have not verified that uh, based on statistical data. I mean, we, saw, we see at the moment there's a correlation uh, and that is one of the explanations we have. So here, for example, you see this is basically a data set uh, for just two years. This is for increase, this is for decrease, so you're quite resistant against decreases of your, invest, of your security investment. Uh, while if you go for um, the whole population, which would be blue, you see that, yeah, you have, you have maybe a 10% better chance uh, of getting higher investments, of increasing your investments, which is not too bad if you're a CISO and you desperately need some money. Um, yeah, another thing is, of course, we also, yes, yeah, sorry, there's a question. No, we did, not, we did not ask the development teams. Or do you mean whether we had a follow-up question with the CISO? I mean, some industries take it. I'm sorry, I didn't I'll get your point. Though. So you mean whether there was investment outside of the view of the CISO? Normal R&D budget, yes. Yeah. Uh, we did not distinguish between these two areas. So we asked the CISO, does your organization invest more? In the hope that the CISO would have some visibility into uh, what others do. That might not, not be the case, but yeah. On the other hand, the chance is good that he has some idea because uh, usually you have to justify security investments and quite heavily. Um, yeah, so we also looked at breaches. What's kind of the effect of a breach on an organization? And as I said before, uh, from a statistical correlation, we didn't find much. However, it was uh, quite funny. We asked the whole population, uh, after a breach, do you invest more? Do you spend more after a breach? 30% said yes, and the others said, well, actually, no. We're not going to change. But when we kind of drove down, narrowed down the population, and only looked at the people who actually had a breach, then over half recognized, yes, we're going to spend more, probably because they felt the pain and went through the process. So they know uh, how painful a breach can be and what's the typical consequence. Um, why do I find this useful? 
it might be an indicator that security managers are underestimating the effect of a breach on an organization. It might be that, yes, you haven't seen a breach yet, so you think, well, of course we wouldn't change because we are comfortable with what we are doing, but the moment you had a breach, you suddenly wise up, so you learn. So it might be then there's an indicator for the people who hadn't, who haven't been breached yet, or who just don't know yet, that maybe you're under-investing. And if you talk with your managers, maybe that's a conversation you want to have. Okay, so that was about investing. Um, now we are also looking about, okay, how do you manage your organizations? What kind of things are you doing? How do you, do you build security in, or is just everybody driving by and kind of passing around your security controls and just ignoring your organization? Um, or for example, one of the key questions we had um, was do you use an application security management system, which is a little bit, or, or maturity model? Um, this is a little bit inspired because at OWASP we have OpenSAM and uh, I personally also believe if you want to write a good security program, you should know where you are. Because only if you know where you are and you basically have an understanding, then you can write a good roadmap where you want to be. Uh, a little bit surprising to me was if you look at, um, we had yes and fully uh, formally implemented, yes without verification and currently in process. If you take all these three together, it's only 25%. So that means 75% uh, are not using a maturity model, don't benchmark themselves, and basically are not really uh, formally or, or kind of looking in a structured way at where they are, at the own quality of their security systems. However, there is one kind of glimmer of hope at the horizon and that's these guys. 40% were saying, no, we don't have it, but we're considering doing it in the next 12 months. So it will be, it will be interesting to see whether that's actually true. I mean, you can consider a lot, yeah? but um, I have still some hope in these guys that they may move here and uh, that we see an uptick in people actually looking inside, analyzing where they are, and then having a structured approach in improving their security. Um, so what other challenges do people see? Um, again, we, I was kind of expecting, oh, budget is so problematic. But quite clearly it was that availability of skilled resources was the key challenge of improving your security programs, of delivering and improving security for an organization. So yeah, budget is uh, on number four, but it was very clear that uh, People don't have the skilled resources to actually get the stuff on the road. Yeah, there's money, but it's, it's kind of you don't have the resources you, you, you want to use. Yes, please. They're in order. Yes. That's number one, two, three, four, five. Do you have an idea of exactly how much above the rest of them? Um, It was not only just ahead of number two. So uh, this was a clear ranking, especially the first three. Mm -hmm. Actually, yeah, the first three were, was, was quite clear. Uh, these two were, uh, you could have done the scoring a little bit different, then you might have had a different result. So to give you some insight, uh, we, we use a scoring for this because people can rate one, two, number uh, between one and five. And we basically weighted number five more than just linearly above number four. But we tried three different scoring schemes, like uh, weight one, maybe double, one and uh, one fifty percent more and something. And these were this order was consistent across different weighting schemes. So it's quite quite stable. Um, except on the on number four and five, they were very close to each other. But but these these are these are quite clear. Uh, by the way, the whole report is public, of course, and open and free, and you can download it, of course. And the slides will be available afterwards. Um, I, f I find this interesting because, I mean, we are here at the university, so I hope that uh, availability of skilled resources, I mean, this is the place, okay? This is the time. 
Uh, and equally for us as an industry, it shows that we really have to improve and, and teach people more about this. Skilled resources does not only mean pen testers, that means developers, uh, testers who are aware of security. Um, this one, this ranking is slightly different. So your question actually would apply to this ranking. Uh, we asked them, okay, which of the OWASP projects did you find most useful? And just as a disclaimer first, first hand, we did not give them a list of 160 projects that we have at OWASP because kind of no brain would really feel comfortable in going through that list and choose five and rank them. However, it was absolutely clear that the OWASP top 10 was leading by far. Okay, this was kind of totally clear, unquestionable. While the other four were kind of on the same level. So it's like if you would build a, a, a tower, this is like the top of the tower and these are about um, halfway. And then you have a number of other topics which are maybe one fourth of, of, the, of the tower. Yes, please. Testing guide was in the list, yes. Oh. Testing guide was in the list, but it it's was not. in the list, but not in, but not in uh, this uh, top five. Yeah, it did not make it to the top five, yes. What about application security validation? Yes. It was on the list. Yes. Yes, they were on the list. Um, well, I mean, if you have top five, uh, only five can make it, okay? And um, to be clear, these are security managers. So they were thinking about, okay, what is useful from our perspective? That doesn't necessarily mean it's the perspective of the development manager or of the testing manager. Um, for example, this one is good for, for manager, from a manager perspective because it gives them secure coding policies. And CISOs tend to think in policies and governance. Um, yeah, development guide is maybe, yeah, you can think about. OWASP top 10, yeah, awareness tool. And obviously you also have a bias that People didn't know everything, okay? You have a lot of people who just don't know this stuff and then, yeah, they can't really judge. Um, oh, another thing we asked, this is more kind of internally in OWASP, but I find it also worthwhile to share. We asked, what do you find useful from OWASP? So what do you expect? What kind of, uh, what significance does OWASP material have for you? And it was quite clear, awareness is very useful for them. Um, code development guidelines, policy, testing, so that would include testing guide. However, for example, going to conferences, yeah, is, is useful, but not as useful as the awareness material. So, yeah, we are happy to be here at the conference, but, well, yeah. Uh, what else? Yeah, two more things. Um, as part of, we, we were also wondering what is actually part of an information security management program. So, so what do CISOs see as part of their role and what do they tend to just ignore? And I mean, it's kind of obvious, you have requirements, risk management, most people kind of three and four. I was even surprised that it's only, only 75%. Um, the red one is what's, current, what's planned to be in there and then no plans to implement is the green one. So I was even surprised that it's only 80% or 78% in these two areas. However, what I found quite astonishing is use of as STLC, only 48%, only half of people see this as part of their information security management. I mean, personally, I thought, well, actually, everybody should have that. I mean, but yeah, yeah, I know I'm wrong. I, I know, the, the lady in the front is kind of shaking her head. Yes, I know, and I'm, in, I'm an idealist, I'm a naive person. Um, however, so th this was quite interesting to kind of understand, okay, what are others doing? And for example, threat modeling is really not in play. And we can preach, but uh, yeah, it is not really wide, widely adopted. Um, well, here, here on the top, you see some stuff that you can do. Yes?
Um, I think these are two questions. One is SDLC, the other one is threat modeling. But I'm seeing a very, uh, there's a very big sort of trend towards yes. more frontline development and the lower. Yes. I'm worried about it purely because C plus plus is not the same as C plus plus. And then concentrated on the strategy. So, so the question for uh, the live stream is is the CISO maybe only looking at strategic? Priorities while totally ignoring uh, the actually the, the, the work, the, the, the real work to, to basically people and don't even care and don't specify in their information security programs. Yeah. Um, from, this, from the data, it, I mean, there is some indication. Uh, we did not investigate deeper whether that's the source. From my personal experience, and I've, well, I've been working with a lot of CISOs, uh, like hundreds, um, that could, that, actually no, I don't think that's the case. It could be, but I don't think, because I think most CISOs would know if you're using a secure development lifecycle. Sorry. So yes. Exactly. Yeah, they, they basically, they go in, uh, yeah, that, that would be a good, so the point was whether they don't have a structured approach to security management, yeah. And this is more, yeah, you do this because you kind of have to and maybe your colleague told you to, but you don't look at all the, the whole value chain of security. But these top results are, are from a basis only, for example, management or oh, yeah. security training. I'll be careful, the question was about information security management. So this was not only applications. For example, SDLC or threat modeling are application specific. Right. Okay. Yes, yes, though, though some organizations. As, as CISOs, they are not aware of. Application specific risk. Specific. Yeah, the, the point might be that CISOs are not yet aware of application specific threats. Um, in some organizations, SDLC includes external purchasing and suppliers. So, mm -hmm. which would then again point you that actually you should have that higher, but you don't. I've seen a number, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yes. Yes, that might be the case. Yeah. I find it really a short question. Yeah. How, how do we implement the policy? You can say, I want everybody to write secure code, but then you have to show them how. Okay. Um, I mean, Yeah, I, I, I think, I mean, th there is some truth in different things, and there's a lot of speculation you can do, obviously. I hope we will get a much larger data set with the next survey, and maybe can drill down a little bit. Um, my personal experience, this is kind of just really anecdotal, is that actually still a number of organizations are in the process of getting their SDLC in some way better. And it's, it's totally stunning for me when I go in and, and work with these companies that their SCLC is kind of more basic and doesn't really include security problems. And then you kind of see there's a lot of opportunity <laughs> to get to improve, yeah? So, yeah. Sorry that I don't have a better answer. It's just uh, I present you the data as I have it. Uh, actually, at the end, there might be, uh, I would also very much welcome ideas from you about what other questions we should ask. <laughs> Because asking the right question is quite important to get a good answer. <laughs> um, another one was also we were wondering about what frameworks do people use? So for example, is ISO 2701 widely used? Which you can say it is. It's close to 
are actually having that in use in their organization, which is not surprising. I mean, if you talk with people, it's fairly common. Um, then PCI DSS, well, yeah, if you touch credit card data, probably you had to go through this painful process. Um, ETL NIST, uh, National Institute for Standards and Technology of the US government. Uh, COBIT, CMMI, which is a maturity model. ISF, BSIM, and you know what, then it kind of got a little bit depressing for me because OpenSAM is uh, the OWASP uh, maturity model. And personally, I'm a big fan because it's so easy. I mean, compared to some of the other models, you, you kind of, in them, you have to read like 200 pages and write 100 at least to get started. Uh, with OpenSAM, you read like 30, 40 pages and are done in a day. So I'm kind of, well, I think we have a, a marketing, a promotion problem here. Um, still, I hope, you know, I'm an idealist, I'm an optimist, so I hope we can maybe work on that. Yes, sir. I see the data. A lot of us have invested in these same or How do you interpret this slide? Oh, okay. Um, I mean, first of all, I would say um, what I interpret is definitely ISO 2701 is well established. Right. So um, if you're going in an organization that doesn't have anything, that seems to be useful to some degree, or people require it. And for the others here, BSIM and so on, CMMI, actually I think this is, uh, how would you say, the race is still open. Uh, uh, sorry, yes. 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 That that was not an exclusive choice. Just to be clear, you could tick all of them if you wanted to. So I mean, you could. I mean, you can be very much right. It could, for example, another indicator could be that most organizations are reasonably okay with the basics. You know, getting ISO, getting PCI DSS, kind of doing your base homework but they haven't really dabbled into maturity models or application security yet. Yes, 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 it, it kind of, it, it fits with, they have not a structured approach or, or they, their, stru their structured approach is not sophisticated enough, not, not mature enough. That, yeah, the data kind of supports itself, yeah. Yes? So, so I think this slide is To areas that are below the radar for him to mm -hmm. more tactical implementation. That slide is a, is a similar challenge. It starts off asking about things he knows, mm -hmm. 2001, or things that he hasn't. Yes, I, I would. Uh, um, so the point was uh, of the gentleman in the front. I'm just for the for the mic. Was that. Um, the CISO maybe is not going into the uh, tech, tactical uh, doing things, rather on the governance area. Yeah, exactly. So, so there may be code review going on, maybe yeah. an SPLC. Large organization might not be able to doesn't mark it as currently in use. So the CISO might not know that you do code review and you do it anyway. I, yeah, I, yeah, I'm not so sure about whether there's, well, I mean, there is stuff going on that the CISO doesn't know for sure. It's more usually the stuff that he, that you don't want to tell him. Uh, I mean, the good news uh, tend to make it. The bad news, but, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of hypothesis we could, uh, and, and speculation. I mean, it's consistent. Yeah. It, the, the you're right, the two set data sets are consistent in that regard. 
one thing maybe from our conversation now would be to say uh, application security hasn't made it yet on the desk of the CISO. I mean, they see, they want to, I mean, on the, at the very beginning of the presentation, you saw they know we have to invest more in application security. So they, they know that. But it seems it hasn't trickled down on actually doing stuff. Okay, so one last one was we were also asking, okay, do you actually kind of uh, look at quality um, and effectiveness? Do you, do you assess your own quality of your security programs? And um, I'm sorry that the, I think the, the, I, the, the characters are too small for on the screen. So some of them, actually quite a number of them, do at least some internal self-assessment. We did not quantify whether that's kind of, it happens once in a lifetime or once a year or whatever. But yeah, we, we wanted to be a little bit open in that. Um, a number of them still have external assessment. And maybe for that it might be useful to be aware that uh, I would say this was more larger organizations who were submitting to that survey. So, for example, we did, uh, we did have quite a large population, part of the population was, was very large corporations and only very few were smaller organizations. Um, code review, assessments, and well, there's quite some people who just don't do assessments at all. So yeah, we implement stuff and then we don't measure. Um, good, or not so good, Let's see, oh, the, yeah. And that is then whether you do that externally, so verification of the security of external partners. So if you buy stuff from someone else, do you actually verify what their security posture is? Do you th and because you use their software, so they are part of your risk of your security problems. Um, some of them do by your organization's application security or, or procurement functions. Some rely on self assessment by the partner. So basically you ask them, please assess yourself and tell me what you think. Yeah. Um, some use independent external assessment. So that would be like an audit. And then some just trust people. Yeah, uh, like about one in four trusts. And they say, well, if we trust our suppliers, we don't do any security assessment and we don't ask them. Oh, I find this uh, quite interesting because uh, if you think about how, how deep people are integrated with their suppliers today, um, this tends, could be a blind spot for organizations. Yes? This is actually uh, in general, so infrastructure and application. So we did, the question was uh, about verification of security of external partners, providers and contractors. You don't believe that answer? No, I think they might, they might have answered it thinking. Why do you not believe that because data? Because it's core to. to it is, you say it is core to the CISO community to verify the security of your suppliers? Yes. Well, <laughs> yeah. That's the best. I, 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 I can only tell you what we received. Yeah, if you yeah. like, you can I mean, actually have access to the, the question. yeah, we should revise. Maybe we should clarify the question and I'm, I'm actually very much looking forward to feedback and input, mm. um, which will be on the next slide, if you want. <laughs> 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 um, so first, uh, no, before the next slide, I just wanted to give uh, attribution. So um, we had uh, a number of people who wrote the report and then we had a lot of helping hands who helped us um, write the questionnaire, translate it into different languages, send it across different countries and regions. Um, and here's the link to the uh, two documents, the guide and the survey. And yeah, that's the call for volunteers. So, um, we are currently in the process, there will be a CISO guide version two. And of course we are sending out the next CISO survey. Uh, we hope to do that in July, so we don't have much time to add a lot. Um, we're currently in the process of revising the questionnaire 
but if you have ideas, uh, they would be very much welcome. If you like to par take part in the project, absolutely. Uh, we would love that. Um, if, you, if you don't want to take active part, but if you want to kept, be kept up to date, then, for example, if you want to receive the next uh, release of the CISO survey, then you can register here at this URL, and we will send you the questionnaire and only uh, information about the next CISO survey release. So that way you will get an active information. Um, yep. And yeah, questions, kind of the questions I have to you. What kind of information do you think would be useful? So what kind of questions should we ask this time for 2014? And also, maybe to trigger you, if you could ask 1,000 CISOs, because I hope we get that this year, one question, what would it be? What would you want to know? Or any questions from you, of course, to me. So, please. We have two more minutes, I think. Yes? Mm -hmm. And when they saw VSIM, they get incredibly overwhelmed. Yes. Right? They say, this is the 117 effective habits of highly effective people instead of... Yes, yes, yes. And I know it's not meant to be a shortcut, but yeah. I think there's a chasm between no structure and... I would love to see us look for a... Yeah, I mean, what, what OWASP has with OpenSAM in this case is, is kind of a, a small, agile structure. You don't have to do the 117 uh, good habits for security management. You can have actually just seven. And but uh, we have that already. I guess I just wondered how we better advertise that to the people who have I don't know. Yes. The number one issue. The lack of skills? Yes. Actually, that is something that uh, we are looking at at OWASP right now. So um, the OWASP board decided. Um, beginning of this year that as a strategic goal for OWASP will be to tackle that, to develop and roll out development training, secure development training uh, in a wider area. So kind of provide training material for free, maybe even do video training and so on. So this is, this is one of the strategic goals for OWASP. So, so we very much see that as something we can tackle. With a promotion, yes, it would be nice to do it, but I'm not sure, um, I don't know yet the best answer how to tackle it. Okay, people are leaving, so I'm probably over time. Oh, I'm still okay. Just about. Yeah, just about. Have you tried to analyze this data, uh, comparing different types of organization, for example, bank versus software vendor, or versus um, application as a service vendor? The question is whether we uh, split the data and, and sliced it depending on organization type. Um, the data set was not big enough to slice it and still have statistical significance. So if we get this year more people, then hopefully we can do so. But in this case, it wouldn't be prudent to do so. Then, yeah, thank you very much for your attendance, for your questions. Please join the mailing list. Thanks a lot. <laughs>